before I start this, though, I want to get a little sense of, of uh, where people are in terms of how much uh, background with DDD people have. For example, how many people are just kind of, you know, sticking their toe in now and, and have a fairly, uh, like they're just kind of learning about DDD for the first time? Okay, so there's quite a few. How many people have been, like, you know, into this for quite a while, probably read parts of the book or much of the book or etc. How many of So we're kind of evenly split between people who know a lot and people who are just kind of getting started with it, which will make this a little tricky because, of course, what I'm talking about now is sort of, okay, there was all that stuff I said in the book and now this is things that I, I've learned since then. So some of it's like amendments. So remember that thing I said in the book? Well, this is what I mean instead. <laughs> so because of that, I'm just going to do just a little, very quick. I want to uh, talk about something um, that kind of sets the stage. And that is, I want to talk about models and from a DDD perspective, because most people, when they first encounter DDD and they know it has to do with domain modeling, and so they get very focused on uh, the the question of, uh, you know, how do you how do you make nice domain models, and imagine that that's the main activity, uh, but that's not really quite that doesn't really quite hit what domain driven design focuses on, uh, although certainly the model is at the center of things, but it's not the classical, we've got UML diagrams all over the place kind of a thing. And I think you have to go back a step and say, why are we bothering with these models in the first place? Uh, why do it this way instead of another way? This is something which, uh, you know, as I've said many times, we didn't ask that enough. I think modelers still don't ask it enough, but we hardly asked it at all in the early days because it was so self-evidently the best way to do things. But I want to talk about that just a little because, um, and I, I'm not going to go through this full-blown thing here about why to, why to model, but a, a, a lot of it goes to the question of what really is a model in the first place. So I'm going to skip up to that question. And it's very important to keep this in mind. A model is not a UML diagram, though a UML diagram represents some aspects of a model, we hope. It isn't uh, a certain layer of the software. It is really something else. Now, on page three of the book, there's this picture. It's a map from the, uh, China, like in the 1600s or so. And it represents the world, the entire world, this being China, and this being all the other places. And this is kind of a, a typical map that you'd find in... Uh, there were similar maps in Europe at the, uh, a little earlier. But why? Why is this map the way it is? Because a few, not that long before this time, China had this huge fleet of ships going all over the world, and or all over the eastern part of the world anyway. So they knew actually a lot about the uh, geography of the world that isn't represented on this map. So why then? this. And one way of looking at this is to say, look, they got rid of all those ships. They made a conscious decision to turn inward and became very isolationist for time. During that time, this map is perfectly appropriate. It says, center your attention here. Important things are big. Unimportant things are little. Important things are at the center unimportant things are at the edge. If we could, we'd just take all this stuff off. If we could, we'd just show you China. Unfortunately, you're going to encounter those foreigners now and then. It's unavoidable. 
but just hold it to a minimum, remember what's important. And therefore, what you've got here is a kind of a focus on the essential, something that helps you focus on the essential. Here's another map. This one is a few hundred years later. Guess where this one was made? <laughs> so you put the important things at the center and the less important things out at the edge, perhaps. So some things don't change, but other things are different. You don't have that same, you know, make the make us big and the other ones little, for example. Like here's China, here's the United States. They look about the same size on the map. They actually are about the same size. So we could say, well, maybe this map presents things in proportion to their size. And so we can learn things from the map, like China and the US are about the same size, like Greenland's slightly bigger than the US, like Africa's slightly bigger than the US, but smaller than Greenland. <laughs> OK, so we with me so far? Nobody has any objections? <laughs> okay, as most people probably realize, but refuse to admit in front of company, Greenland is not nearly as big as Africa, or even the United States. So, and Africa, of course, is enormous compared to these other places. So why is it that they look so, why are sizes distorted? And as people know, it's because of the projection that's used to take uh, the surface of a sphere and flatten it out onto a flat piece of paper. But there are many ways of doing that. There are many projections. And in fact, uh, some of them would keep the sizes of things the same. You've seen those too. The, the sh you know, things look a little more sort of stretched out, but every land mass has proportional size to its real size. So, this projection, though, is so familiar to us that unless your attention is drawn to that question, you just look at it and say, there's the map of the world. And if it were printed in Europe, maybe it would have Europe at the center, but still, it's that same projection. And so the question is, why is this projection, why was this projection so popular? What made it important to begin with? Anybody know? Well, basically it has one property that's very useful to a certain set of users, and that is that it preserves the direction of things. If you draw a straight line from, say, New York to London on this map, you can derive from that a bearing. And if you keep your ship on that, going in that direction, you'll arrive in London. And that works between any two points, at least probably if you get way up here toward the edge, there's some anomalies. And who would that be useful to? Sailors. Sailors. This originally was designed as a map for navigators, but it was good enough for many other uses. So it was good for that one particular purpose and good enough for other things. I want to define model now. A model is a system of abstractions. I got that out of the dictionary. It's the dictionary definition of model is a system of abstractions. Another way of looking at it is that it describes selected aspects of a domain. Neither of those maps contain nearly all the information that the map makers had about those places. If it had, they would have both just been solid black masses of ink. In fact, what makes a th model or a map useful is that you're very selective. And why do you select the things that you select? And why do you pick a particular system of abstractions, where there are many? It's because it can be used to solve some problem. So now think about some of the conversations you might have heard about models in the past, where people discuss things like, which one of these models is more realistic? Or which one better represents the the actual domain or whatever. I'm here to say that I don't think this is a relevant question for modeling. There's a similar question that I would ask, which is, will this model be useful for communication 
with domain experts, with people who know their business? Will they understand this model? Will it resonate? But realism is a different question. It suggests uh, metaphysics. It's something to talk about over beer. <laughs> and then usefulness is not an absolute either. Because some things are useful for some things, and some are useful for other things. And so when we are modeling, we have to have in mind a specific use, or a specific set of uses. So why is the Mercator map, as it's called, the one with the, the Mercator projection, the one that I was showing, it is useful if you want to navigate at sea using a compass and some stars and whatever. Uh, that's what it's useful for. Um, the other map might be useful if you want to communicate this philosophical or political statement that we are, we are the world. 